Thank you, everybody, for staying so late to, to, for, for this la last talk of the invited talks. Uh, and uh, while, while, while the technicians are setting up my talk, uh, I can um, briefly uh, say, say something about, uh, uh, say, is it work? Uh, yeah, the reason why I have to present from my laptop is because I have a demo, uh, and this is going to be a really cool demo. So stay tuned. Today I'll be talking about two things. Uh, both in language and biology. So in language, I'll be talking about simultaneous translation, and in, in medical AI, I'll be talking about RNA structures uh, and how they are related in, 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 a, in a very cool way. And this talk is really dedicated to the memory of my late advisor, Aravind Joshi, who passed away at the end of last year. Um, Aravind showed me uh, how linguistics and biology actually have the same mathematical foundations, even though they look very different on the surface, but they actually share the same uh, common core. Uh, so er, le, very late in his career, Aravind realized that his grammars, uh, triadjoining grammars, have been applied to, say, RNA structures and protein structures, which he was very surprised about. He was you know, doing linguistics all his life, but he, he realized somebody else is doing, you know, using his stuff to, uh, to do the biology. So, so he, then he recruited me and, and David Chen and, and, and Julia Hockenmeyer to work on that. And we all worked on it a little bit, but we all did not like it. Unfortunately, so much to his uh, disappointment, we all kind of went back to natural language processing because we all love linguistics uh, uh, very much. Uh, but so, so I, I basically did not do any, any biology for 10 years until I moved to Oregon State about three years ago. And one of my colleagues was uh, a biologist, and he just randomly asked this, me this question: Do you know this, uh, you know, stochastic context-free grammars? which can be used to model RNA structures. I was like, yeah, this is what Aaron wanted me to do initially. You know, I, I just didn't do it. Uh, you know, I didn't, didn't quite do it. But, uh, but, but then I re realized that all these 10 years that I spent on natural language, uh, you know, I did linear time parsing algorithms can be applied to um, RNA structures and protein structures without uh, much change. So it's very easily adapted to the other world. And the impact is even bigger than, than that in, in natural language. So that, that's how I got back to biology uh, after the 10-year hiatus. But uh, it was too late for Aravind. Uh, I, I wanted to call Aravind um, later last year because uh, I was told that he was not doing well, but I didn't get a chance to, to do so. And so there was no chance that he, he knew that I actually what kind of can, uh, resumed working in, in computational biology. Um, so I want to dedicate this talk to him. Uh, and in case you, you don't know me, but you probably know my, stu my students, I've, I'm very proud to have graduated four students, uh, PhD students. Ashish was here today, and, and everybody has read his paper. How many of you have read his you know, Attention is All You Need paper? He's the primary author of that transformer paper, which was just mentioned already at least three, several times in, in, in today's talks. Uh, my second student, James, is also here today in Facebook. Um, and my third student, Kai, is in New York, um, Google New York. And my uh, first student, Main Boy, is also here today. He's uh, just defended and he joined my group in Baidu. And he has just done something really, really cool. And I will show you uh, what he did on the next slide, which is simultaneous translation. Um, and most of my research is about you know, uh, parsing and translation. But more recently, as I said, I applied those stuff to um, RNA and protein structures, which is the uh, kind of entree of this talk. So we'll first do the uh, simultaneous translation uh, first. So we know that there are two modes of uh, interpretation in, in human communication. One is consecutive interpretation, and the other is simultaneous interpretation. Consecutive interpretation is often used, we say, when, when President Trump and President Xi met. And, and that's very, very inefficient, because you know, the, the time needed is at least twice as much as uh, you know, if, if they could speak in one language because you know, you, there was a multiple of overhead or latency uh, at, at least two times. But, so that's why uh, there's a trend to kind of switch to simultaneous translation more and more often. So when they meet, uh, the, when they met in, let's say, uh, Florida, they actually did simultaneous translation. And if you look at the fo this photo, it's funny that only Trump himself is not listening to the simultaneous translation. <laughs> Right, so he's just showing that he's and he's just pretending that he he is understanding Chinese. So you know this, uh, that's Trump. And back uh, behind the scene, there is people like these guys that, that like these guys in the United Nations who actually did the simultaneous translation. Right. So the nice thing about simultaneous translation is that it's instead of a multiple latency, it's actually a bit of overhead or plus delta instead of two times, right? And this delta is often less than three seconds in, in practice. 
Uh, but as you know, simultaneous translation is also very difficult to do. It's extremely exhaustive uh, for, for human beings because you have to do simultaneous uh, understanding that is, you know, comprehension and production that is, you know, translating the target language at the same time. So the best people who can do it can only, you know, sustain for like 10 minutes or uh, 30 minutes at, at, at the best. And there are reportedly only 2,000 only 2,000 qualified interpreters, uh, simultaneous interpreters worldwide. You know, think about how difficult that is. And the best interpreters can only kind of retain about 60% of the source material because you have to skip something. So you, otherwise, you, you can't, you, you're going out of memory. So that's why we wanted to, uh, to kind of automate this process by working on simultaneous machine translations. So there's a, really a critical need for that. And that is also extremely difficult, notoriously difficult, because you have to sometimes predict the future. Think about a German verb. German verb in, in the embedded clauses come at the end, right? So you have to wait for a German verb, whereas English German verb, English verb comes, you know, you know after the subject. So, so, you know, there's a kind of a joke in the United Nations that, you know, uh, why are you not translating from German? And the interpreter will say, I'm waiting for a German verb. You know, German verb still hasn't arrived. Uh, you know, so that's very difficult. And so there is a trade-off between latency and quality, right? So if you wait very long, you can wait till the end of the sentence and you translate. And that you can use our, you know, uh, old translation technologies, full sentence translation works really well. Nowadays with transformers uh, network, the blue score is very, very high. But that's not what we wanted. We want, you know, simultaneous translation where you only lag behind by about three seconds. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, you can do word-by-word -word translation, like a glass, but that really doesn't work. Well, it might work for, say, from Spanish to, to French or something like that close, but between very different languages like English and Chinese, where the word order are so different, uh, you would expect the, the, the blue score, the, the quality to be very, very low, even though the latency is very good. So what we want to do is something in between that is both you know, low latency and also high quality. So that's why the, our goal is towards the top left corner. Uh, and uh, the simultaneous, the, the you know, simultaneous interpreters today have like three seconds delay and not too good qualities because they, they can only retain about 60% of the content, right? So we hope that machine translation can do a lot better job uh, than human, tra human uh, simultaneous interpreters. So I, uh, we made a little kind of a demo um, here. So simultaneous speech to text, not, not to speech yet, but simultaneous speech to text translation. Uh, before I play this demo, this is just our research demo and our real production system in Beijing, uh, which by the way Beijing did, is much better in quality because they have shorter ASR latencies. This, this AS latency is slightly bigger than, than expected. So let's look, look at it. 是在莫斯科与俄罗斯总统普京会晤。you can see that this translation system does prediction, anticipation in the future. Even though, like, sometimes the Chinese verb, like German verbs, can, comes at the very end, like, say, uh, President Bush in Moscow with President Putin of Russia meet, right? That's the original Chinese word order. But the uh, simultaneous translation actually predict the met after hearing uh, just uh, President Bush in Moscow with Putin. Because he, he, the, the translation system would think, well, what can P President Bush do uh, in Moscow, right, with President Putin? He cannot play golf. He can only meet with President uh, Putin. So that's why we are doing prediction. Sorry, uh, let me play this video, this part. See here, after hearing, uh, at, in Moscow with, you know, after hearing with in, 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 in Chinese, uh, the translation system already predicts that, well, you have to be meeting somebody. Uh, so that's uh, anticipation. And then the, the word order is actually very fluent in English word order. So in Moscow, the PP phrase, like in Moscow and with Putin, are reordered to the, to, to the end, like in English word order. So it's very nice. Uh, sorry, let me do it again. 美国总统布什在莫斯科与俄罗斯总统普京会晤 
中东地区因为局势动荡，所以区因为局势动荡，所以爆发了战争。This Chinese because comes, you know, at, as the third word, but because was was predicted as the first word. So the word order is very good. 江泽民对法国总统的来华访问表示感谢。So even before hearing anything, like Jiang Zemin, basically the Chinese says Jiang Zemin to President, uh, the French President's visit, uh, and the English translation is already anticipating that Jiang Zemin expressed his uh, appreciation. Uh, because if you have some prior that Jiang Zemin likes the French President, then Jiang Zemin expressed his appreciation to, uh, to, to the visit. Sorry. Um, so this is anticipating. Jiang Zemin, the visit, expressed his appreciation to, uh, to, to the yeah, the, 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 the thank you actually comes at the end of the Chinese sentence, but it was already mentioned here uh, in the middle. So this kind of anticipation feature is actually crucial in human interpreters. Human interpreters do anticipation all the time, because otherwise they just can't have to wait for a German verb all the time, that then, then we cannot do it. But, you know, so, yeah, so this is our demo, and the last sentence... <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's actually very good. And our real uh, production system is actually way better, and we're going to release it very soon. And our paper is going to be uh, online also very soon. Uh, this is the work of my student, Mingbo. And now I'm going to switch to the entree of this talk, that is the RNA structure prediction work. Uh, so that is kind of completely different from, from language, but I will show you that it's actually using the exact algorithm I developed for language parsing, uh, just adapted to RNA structures. So how many people know what is RNA? You know, if you have, you know, so this morning, a uh, professor uh, from Stanford did uh, genomics 101. So this is kind of a molecular biology 101. So there's DNA, which is double-stranded, and there's also RNA, which is single-stranded. And because it's single-stranded, they fold uh, into some structure in nature, just like protein folding. And RNA, unlike protein or DNA, have two rows. DNA has only one row that's genetic information. And protein has only one role that is catalytic function. RNA has both roles. So RNA is actually more important and more fundamental than both DNA and, and protein. So there's a very uh, well-known hypothesis that the world started as RNA. Uh, so there's RNA world's hypothesis. So RNA is often understood as kind of the intermediate stage between DNA and protein. So the information is transcribed from d DNA to RNA and then uh, to, to protein. But it's more than that because the RNA can also regulate this translation uh, uh, and, and many activities in, in, in life. Uh, so there is many RNAs whose structures uh, kind of enable their functions. So in other words, if you have an RNA sequence, you want to know its structure. So that's called structure prediction, also known as folding, because they kind of fold. Uh, and the, reverse, the inverse problem that is given a structure how do I know the best sequence that can fold into that structure is called design. It's all more, more like our natural language generation. So structure prediction is our, like, our parsing, and design is our like, generation, for example. And this talk is mostly about structure prediction. And to kind of formalize it a little bit more, we kind of simplify it uh, so that we can do it mathematically. So the X input is the ACGU sequence, a very, very long sequence. And Y is the output, that's the structure. And for here, uh, we just gonna assume that there are no crossing pairs, so that structure is just either left bracket or dot or right bracket. A dot meaning it's unpaired, and left bracket meaning it's paired with somebody, you know, corresponding right bracket. And each nucleotide can only pair with at most one nucleotide. And the pairing rules are either GC or AU or GU, like comp complementary uh, watson crib based pairs. All right, so this is the structure for, for transfer RNA and it corresponds to a tree structure on the left. So if you look at a tree structure on the left, that corresponds, that's a kind of a model, uh, a representation of the RNA structure, secondary structure. So the structure prediction problem is basically given X input, uh, predict the best Y, that is the Y structure that has, you know, uh, the maximum number of pairs, that, that's a simple example. The real problem is slightly more difficult, but for, for the purpose of this talk, it suffices to say, you just want to find a Y that has the, the largest number of pairs uh, so that the pairs do not cross, right? So the challenge is uh, that existing prediction algorithms are way too slow, and they actually run in speed n cubic. And once you read that it's actually n cubic, you might think, wait, wh where does it come from? Does it look like something that we are very familiar with in NLP? Yes, it does come from NLP. This algorithm is exactly the what algorithm? 
the CKY algorithm from parsing. So exact CKY algorithm, they just borrowed it. And my solution for this challenge is to borrow my algorithm in linear time parsing uh, to adapt it to RNA structures very easily uh, so that we can do linear time RNA structure prediction. Okay, so a little bit about this history or connection between linguistics and biology and with computer science in the middle. And we're gonna show you that these three fields have the same mathematical foundation and that foundation is Chomsky's uh, context-free grammar. So, so in my view, everything started with Chomsky's uh, context-free grammar. So it's not just the foundation of modern linguistics, it's also one of the foundations of modern computer science. Uh, and now it's being applied to, to biology, it's very exciting. So um, here, uh, if I have a, I, I do not have, so this is the uh, context grammar is being applied to computer science and we describe, you know, programming language with that. And then we have CKY parsing uh, in the 60s and then uh, CKY parsing was borrowed to RNA structures in the 80s. Uh, so they, they were always like 20 years behind NLP. So biology is always 20 years behind NLP. So we're, we're feeling good. Uh, and, and a lot of their algorithms actually come from our field. So, so a lot of them, not just this CKY. Uh, and then in 65, Canoes did uh, LR parsing, which is in linear time, but it can only be applied to a very specific kind of a small set, subset of, of grammars. Uh, and Tomita generalized it to parse any context free grammar. Uh, and, but, but his stuff was very popular in the, in the 80s, but then was quickly forgotten in the 90s because machine learning started to, to dominate. And then I, uh, my, my collaborator Kenji Sage revived it uh, in 2010, and we got the modern version of uh, you know, generalized LR, uh, and we can do linear time parsing with dynamic programming. So, and then uh, after many years, we, we had applied it to RNA structures to do linear time RNA structure prediction with dynamic programming as well. And that's only half of the story. The other half of the story is that my advisor, Ivan Joshi, worked on some more advanced grammars beyond context free grammar structures, that is, true joining grammars and mildly context sensitive grammars, which can be used to model crossing structures, not those just nested structures, but crossing structures in natural language. So there is actually evidence that there is crossing structures in natural language. And uh, after many years, so people realize that it can be used to model the crossing structures in RNAs and proteins as well. So that's how Aravind got very excited, got, got you know, super excited about that. Um, and he, he started this project. Uh, so this person is Tomita. So how many people know Tomita? <laughs> so probably only Kevin <laughs> and, very, and, and Ken. Very, very few people who, 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 who yeah, were, were, were like, like much older than we are. So Tomita is actually a very cool guy. So he, um, <laughs> You know, he, he, he had two PhD students, and one is Kevin Knight, the other uh, is uh, Alain Lavie, right? And, and yeah, Kevin spoke earlier this morning, and uh, Kevin is also a co-advisor of mine, and uh, Alain Lavie is, is an advisor of Kenji Sage, so there is some lineage here. But after uh, Tomita did this generalized LR process and it was very successful, he actually got bored. He, he, he found that uh, there was something more important in life, that is biology, so he actually quit NLP, and went back to Japan and redo another PhD. So he got his second PhD in molecular biology, like wet lab, real biology. And now, in the 90s, and now he's a, he's a real like, computational biology professor, very, very successful one, also in, in, in Japan. So my conclusion is that smart people do switch from computational linguistics to computational biology. So it's not a coincidence. It's not, no, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about Tomita and my advisor, Aaron Joshi. No. Okay, so uh, just to preview the results of our linear time prediction with dynamic programming, so it's obviously very fast, in linear time, and the impact of this work is much bigger in biology than in language, because in language, you know, you, know, you get to linear time processing, people say, oh, how, how, how important is linear time? Well, not too important, because sentences are not very long. Chin uh, like, word, like language sentences are like 100 words long at most. Very, very rarely you would have 100 word sentences. But in biology, you can have much longer sequences, like 3,000 nucleotides. HIV is like uh, about 10,000 nucleotides, uh, and you can have even longer sequences. It's a lot more often. So nowadays, with the uh, advance of deep learning, my stuff, like dynamic programming, efficient algorithms, are less and less important, and frankly speaking, uh, in, in language, because language are very deterministic. They evolve to be very deterministic, and with more accurate models like you know, the RNNs and transformers, we, we need less and less search, right? But in biology, we still need a lot of search because the vocabulary size here is only four. It's A, C, G, U 
in DNA or RNA, and also about 20 in protein, right? So search is still very important. So like in language we say, uh, you hear the word the, you know you're starting a noun phrase, right? You don't know where it would end, but you know you're starting a noun phrase when you hear the word the. But here you, you see a, a nucleotide like A or C or G, or you have no idea where it would, part, would, would, would com, com, combine, right? So search is still very important. Uh, so that's why my work is actually found a, a, another application which is more important than, than the origin. And more importantly, it has even better accuracy, not just being faster, it actually has m even better accuracy. And how did we did it? Yeah, so, so here's some more details. So it's just to you know, review, this is CKY parsing, and um, so this is coming from NLP, and it's uh, cubic time, and you know, it's just uh, bottom-up parsing, and you can, do, you can use that to solve RNA secondary structure prediction, just to figure out the maximum number of pairs for a given sequence, right? That's very easy, uh, but that's too slow. And how are we gonna do it in linear time? You're just gonna you know, pretend that you can scan from left to right, so this is the first idea. But each nucleotide, you have three options, you know, either push or pop or skip, right? So you have three to the end choices. So this is exponential, it's not good. And you say, how can we do it better? Uh, we want to do dynamic programming by merging equivalent states, right? So I will not go into any details, but I'll just do very high level. So you can, you know, kind of claim some states are equivalent, and then you can merge them, and then you can reduce the, the complexity from three to the n to n to the three, from exponential to polynomial, and on top of this polynomial space, you do beam search to make it linear time, right? So this is very similar to my work before, and a little bit more details, so this is all the three to the n uh, path, a lot of uh, stuff, but you wanna say, oh, some, some states might be equivalent, and how do we define equivalence? Well, if they have the same stack, then they are definitely equivalent. More important, if they don't have the same stack, but have the same stack top, they are also considered temporarily equivalent because you know, if you have the same stack top, then you're go uh, going to find uh, a nucleotide to match with it, so you're, you can temporarily be packed together, and then we can do packing and unpacking, and that, you know, come back to the graph st stack idea from Tomita uh, many, many years ago, right? And more interestingly, this packing and unpacking idea uh, of local ambiguity is also found in language, and it's found in both biology and language, right? So in language, we have something like this. John and Mary had two papers. And say, is this sentence ambiguous at all? Well, probably not. But actually, after I review to you the last word, each or together, you, you might realize, oh, wow, it actually has some other readings. I did not notice that even, you know, this little sentence that John and Mary can be collaborating or not collaborating, right? But before I review to you the last word, are you aware that John and Mary actually had ambiguities? You probably are not even aware of that, right? So in a sense, you pack some local ambiguity and you go on. And if you need to unpack, you unpack. So this is supported by some psycholinguistic evidence, and interestingly, that there has a connection in biology as well. So, you know, the two fields are also very, connect, uh, very well connected. Okay. So another way to view this is left to right CKY. So instead of bottom up CKY, you do left to right CKY. And you can also do right to left CKY. But even though all these algorithms are in cubic, the left to right or right to left CKYs can be applied with beam search to make a linear time. So that's another way to understand our algorithm. And the other connection with incremental parsing is that human beings do parse sentences incrementally. Like just as you hear me speak, you're doing incremental parsing all the time. And RNAs and proteins start to fold as they're being assembled as well. So they're kind of incremental folding, or they call it co-transcriptional folding as well. And we know that human language sentences evolved to be able to parse uh, incrementally. And so, so for, for RNAs and proteins, their sequences evolved to be able to fold in incrementally as well. And these might explain why uh, my linear time beam search algorithm perform actually better in terms of accuracy uh, than exact search. Um, and here's the uh, efficiency again, and the accuracy is that we are slightly more accurate than exact search, and you can see that we are doing a lot more uh, correct pair pairs. The uh, blue ones are correct pairs, the, the red ones are incorrect pairs. And we have the world's fastest RNA structure prediction server online, and also last, uh, fast structure prediction also helps RNA design. And this is some work that uh, uh, Professor Richard Das from Stanford Medical School is using my stuff, uh, to do, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is embarrassing, Microsoft, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why I don't like Microsoft, but, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and <laughs> 
faster structure prediction also enables faster design, and we can use RNA design to detect and, and cure diseases like tuberculosis. Okay, so before I st stop, uh, I just want to briefly mention the three levels of medical AI, uh, and it kind of relates to three levels or three kind of stages or three kind of uh, paradigms of NLP. Uh, the first is backwards classification, no sequence, no structure. Second is sequence. And the third is kind of structures, synthetic structures, semantic structure. And the stuff that, something like medical imaging or EHR or PubMed, you know, information extraction that Hawaii phone talked about earlier this morning was the, the first level that is mostly focusing on phenotype with no access to uh, genotype. Uh, no offense to Hawaii phone, uh, he's a good friend of mine, but we need to go deeper. So the second talk uh, in this morning's uh, biomedical session was on genomics from Stanford, uh, a professor from Stanford. Uh, but we could need to go even deeper to structural genomics because sometimes it's not just enough to see, oh, you have a point mutation, but it's more important to say, oh, does this mutation actually disturb your structure, uh, kind of cause misfolding? Because many times you, 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 do, you have point mutations, but it doesn't not affect the structure, but sometimes it does. So it's kind of, kind of three levels corresponding to three levels in NLP as well. So we need to go deeper and deeper in medical AI. Uh, we need to stru study structures. So I would thank you very much in linear time, and uh, we are hiring. Uh, we are in Sunnyvale, and we have a, a very good basic research lab. I've worked mostly in universities, but I also worked at Google Research, IBM Research, and Bio Research. And Bio Research is by far the best uh, research place, believe me. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, William, Kai Wei, and Liang for the amazing talks and the amazing demos. So for the last lighting talk session of the day, we have Ashwin Paranjape from Stanford, Sarah Rabi from Twitter, and Najon Kim from JHU. And after that, we'll have um, happy hour and poster session. And please don't leave yet, because I'll have specific instructions on how to get beer and wine. Thank you. Wow, the screen is huge. Um, my advisor looks scary now. Uh, thanks, Facebook, for hosting the event. Um, I am Ashwin. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on incorporating uh, structure into language models. Um, this is joint work with Siva Reddy and Chris Manning from Stanford. So I chose language modeling as a task to um, introduce a new kind of method. And I think it's a nice task because it's kind of self-contained. Now, let's look at the motivation, and then we'll go over to what kind of structure we want to introduce. So um, the motivation is that uh, we know RNN and LSTMs can model language pretty well. And then they also have, uh, theoretically, an infinite context that they can hold in memory. But however, in practice, they have a limited long-term capacity. For instance, if you take the sentence when reports of an imminent agreement circulated, the circulated word uses hidden representation of agreement and so on. However, linguistically, reports is responsible for generating circulated. Um, unfortunately, the words are uh, off. So um, to see this, uh, just remove a chunk, uh, the chunk of an imminent agreement, and you'll see that the resulting sentence is valid and subsumed by the original sentence. So the idea is to uh, give uh, empower RNNs by uh, providing skip connections over optional chunks. And for this uh, purpose, we uh, have a tree structure called optional constituency trees, uh, which is a hierarchical structure which identifies constituents, which are contiguous spans in a sentence that are optional. Uh, for instance, in this case, the spans inside the bracket uh, are optional. Um, so once we have defined the tree structure that we want to introduce, the model itself is not very difficult. Um, so the bracket RNN, which is what I call it, uh, pr processes the brackets linearly uh, along with the input words from left to right. So before encountering a bracket, um, it just goes along as it usually would have done. When it sees an opening bracket, uh, it takes the current hidden state, in this case the hidden state after reports, and pushes, pushes it or saves it onto the stack. Similarly, uh, right before imminent, it also saves the current hidden state. Now. When it encounters uh, a closing bracket, which is when you would have uh, wanted the hidden state of an, it pops off that hidden state, uh, merges it with the hidden state of the current word, which is imminent, 
and then tries to uh, give probabilities for the next word, which is agreement. And similarly, uh, when you want to predict the word, uh, probabilities for the word circulated, um, it merges the hidden states of report and agreement. So you can see the model has a choice uh, when it wants to merge uh, in terms of how much information it wants from the current context and from uh, the previous context. Uh, yeah. So uh, we did some uh, preliminary experiments uh, to see how well does this, uh, like what's the upper bound on the improvement that we can get by introducing such a kind of structure. So uh, we took goal dependency trees uh, and applied heuristics to convert it into optional constituency trees. Uh, we mapped dependency arcs such as subject to required and oblique to optional and so on. Uh, we provide this option, uh, optional constituency structure to the language model um, and we use AWD LSTM as a baseline uh, which has shown strong performance on the pen tree bank. Uh, so we see uh, that uh, if you, for instance, had one layer, uh, the, the, you can't see the test perplexities here, but the differences are almost the same. Uh, so the validation perplexity for one layer goes, up, uh, goes down from 90 to around 70, and less perplexity is better. Similarly, for uh, three layers, the validation perplexity decreases by around 12 perplexity points. Um, so the future work uh, is going to be to compare optional constituency trees with other structures such as random bracketing, self-attention, and balanced binary trees. Uh, and more importantly, to learn a joint model for left to right language modeling along with incremental OCT parsing, the kind of structure that we were wanting to use. Um, if you are interested in uh, introducing different kinds of structures and different kinds of tasks, please come and talk to me in the poster session. Thank you.